Uh, a single word. Well, that is for others. A reliable. Committed. Great. Decent. What if it's the same as other people's words? Grand. Strong, actually. Sound. The consummate politician. I, I think you'll get the same words over and over again. Tenacious. Tenacious. Uh, tenacious. Well, I don't argue with that. I think guts. Gutsy. I don't argue with that. Inspirational. That's nice. Magnificent. Well, that's even better. Well, I think the one I'll say you'll have heard before. Determined. Determined. Uh, constant. Conviction. Conviction. One word to describe John Howard. Relentless. the Liberal Party was back in power. At last, John Howard had the chance to reshape the nation according to the values he held most dear. He loves the flag, John Howard. He put the flag on, uh, on his car. Menendez had had the flag on his car. Good morning, Prime Minister. Good morning. He was always a great believer in those symbols. He's a sort of a nationalist, which was a bit odd for a Liberal Party leader. Whether or not the Australian flag or things like Gallipoli, he had a real passion for him. I, John Winston Howard, do swear that I will well and truly serve the people of Australia. I came to the Prime Ministership with some very clear views as to where I wanted to take the country. And in comes John Howard, and he says, look, he, he values families, he values small business, he values hard work. John Howard is a bit like a safe uncle, and we'll put him in there. He's not going to do anything wrong. In fact, he'd probably do a lot of things right. In winning the 1996 election, John Howard snatched Labor's heartland with a 45-seat majority. Congratulations. Thank you, Alan. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Most impressive performance. You must be very pleased. I am. It was bigger and more comprehensive than I had expected. I would not have won the victory that I did on Saturday without probably 40% of trade unionists voting for the Liberal and National That's Party. Great. I think the nature of his victory gave him uh, uh, enormous power within the party. He led, uh, others listened and followed. I definitely remember him saying to the party room that you know, when you change the government, you change the country. That was certainly the, the perception within the office. Gee, we're finally there, you know. The, the barbarians have stormed the gates, they've got into the castle, and what's here? <laughs> What they found was a group of public servants who'd worked closely with the former Labor government. Things were set to change. Within his first week as Prime Minister, John Howard sacked not one, but six department heads. He would handpick the country's most senior bureaucrats. Uh, I was telephoned on the Friday after the election. Uh, the Prime Minister wanted me to become Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and I asked what was happening to my predecessor. No, 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 your predecessor's already gone. He's been sacked. It was as if the whole public service was going to be turned on its head. It became celebrated in Canberra as the so-called Night of the, uh, the Long Knives, but that was essentially a decision of the PM. John Howard was making his mark. But a rude shock would stop the Prime Minister in his tracks. An unexpected $9 billion budget deficit. I thought, crikey, this is going to be tough. I knew then that we were going to have a very tough year. 
and a tough number of years. The responsibility of the budget fell to the young treasurer. Peter Costello was about to be tested. Well, we're in Sydney at the Commonwealth Parliament offices and Peter went into that meeting looking fairly relaxed and he came out looking ashen-faced and he was genuinely um, shocked at the size of the, of the deficit. You know, I felt like, you know, I was the bloke that had been past the parcel uh, and this parcel was ticking. Uh, and, and, and the guy that had put the ticking time bomb inside the parcel had left the scene. And if I didn't fix it uh, quickly, it would explode in my face. I never expected to be in this position. Peter Costello and Finance Minister John Fay now had to get down to the brutal business of slashing government programs. <clears throat> I guess it bonded, uh, it bonded us, it bonded me and John Fay. And what I remember was the bitter cold Canberra winter and the days and nights in the windowless, airless cabinet bunker. It was intense, it was difficult, it uh, was taxing. And I contented myself with this. I thought, you know, maybe you know, this would end my political career. You know, these budget cuts would be so unpopular, but I contented myself with the idea I would have done something for Australia. <laughs> One by one, the ministers come forward, they put their proposals. Most of them wanted to spend. Very few volunteered savings. There were times when there were stand-up brawls. Um, there were times when ministers walked out. As the ministers argued, one man stood above it all. John Howard. Your first budget's got to send a clear message, and the clear message was that we were a reformist government. He would always reserve the right to review the decisions we took. And if he didn't like them, he would give us reasons. And uh, again, Prime Ministers have the, uh, have the last say. I used to say to him, John, look, we just spent far too much money on sport. You know, cut back some of that stuff. You know, if people want to play sport, they can pay for it themselves. He'd look down the cabinet table at me and he'd say, are you mad? He'd say... John Howard was saying, we're going to cut everywhere. We're not going to cut the fence. And I kept coming back to him and saying, look, this is silly. You know, 20,000, we might be cutting out of CWA. And you got this whole defence budget. And we had this argument, da 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 And he said, in the end, he said, indulge me, I'm the Prime Minister. Only eight weeks into his Prime Ministership, a devastating event in Tasmania would overwhelm the government and the nation. Apparently there's a man gone berserk with a gun down at the store. At the kiosk. They believe the man walked into a cafeteria at the Port Arthur historic village, opening fire with a semi-automatic rifle. I grabbed my youngest daughter and I, I was running like hell. I was couched, crouched and I was just looking through the car windows to see which way he's going and he was following us. I thought I was dead. With 35 people dead, the 28th of April, 1996, was the darkest of days. This is an event that has shaken the core of this country and in a way that no other uh, individual crime has done in my lifetime. The nightmare unfolded around half past two this afternoon. A lone gunman armed with a high-powered rifle entered the... One of those sickening days uh, when the, the news actually makes you feel uh, disturbed and uh, and sickened in the stomach. Eyewitnesses said the gunman appeared excited but was in total control. Of the I was situation. totally and utterly um, uh, thunderstruck that there could be such an appalling loss of life at uh, the hands of one man uh, in this you know, desolate, tiny part of Australia. Uh, it really um, rocked the nation in an in a, in incredible way. Uh, it affected me. John Howard embraced a new role as the nation's